Greetings everyone and welcome to Afrobelly. My name is Linnea. I am a multidisciplinary artist, mystic and wellness facilitator and this is the fifth episode of my personal series, Life After Death. This episode is an expose and due to the serious nature of this video, I decided that it does not deserve visuals. Like the previous episodes, this is a personal story, but this one is not about my blood family. And as much as I have enjoyed using a range of visuals in my documentaries, they reflect my own passion and imagination. While as solemn and harrowing as this story is, is as sparse as I think the visuals need to look. I love every person I have spoken of so far in life after death from an ancestral perspective but this is not necessarily the case in this episode, as events will show that blood is truly thicker than water. This video isn't a tribute or a cinemized series of alleged incidents. My personal sharing is a historic account of my own experiences, and I have received permission to share some of the experiences of other women who may be involved. This is a true story about my favourite drama teacher, Juliette Kalai, and her son, Ramon Kalai. It is a story I never thought I would share publicly, but the Kalais themselves have brought me here. This story is for all of Ramon Kalai's victims and for all victims of sexual assault, regardless of gender or location. May the healing reach those who need it as another vile, soulless sexual offender is being publicly named, shamed, and held accountable for his actions. As mentioned in the previous episodes of Life After Death, I love the performance arts. Since I was three years old and living in London, I trained in ballet, tap, jazz, modern and contemporary dance, in addition to competing in musical theatre competitions up until around six years of age. When my family migrated to Jamaica, I spent a year participating in the arts in the local community until we moved to Mandeville and I started to attend performing arts clubs at Belair Prep and undertaken dance training at the Culture School of Dance that is run by an island-wide known teacher, Mrs. Russell Smith. I lived and breathed the arts. I trained with Mrs. Smith for four years, in addition to performing in her annual performances in the local Cecil Charlton Hall in Mandeville. Like all my teachers, she saw my gifts and passion and would ask me to come in an hour early on Saturdays so I could teach the younger class and assist with the choreography. We trained three days a week for four years. By the time I was 10 years old, I had performed my entire life and had the opportunity to choreograph my dance ensemble for the annual dance performance in Cecil Charlton Hall. This was a major accomplishment for a little 10 year old girl. As a young child, I had always orchestrated the children in my neighborhood and got them to perform community showcases for all of our neighbors. We often charged a small amount for tickets and it was this passion that first let me know, although I was a child, I could teach other children my age and younger pretty well. As I have studied art throughout the years, I have always developed close relationships with my teachers, from Mrs. Schillings in London, to my school music teacher, Mrs. Longmore, to Mrs. Russell Smith, my dance teacher, I looked up to my teachers and was always aware that performance art was my truest passion. I had just turned 11 when I started Manchester High School after passing my common entrance examinations, which was the only way to gain access into a Jamaican high school at that time, unless you were good at sports. Students had three years to pass this exam and graduate from primary school. So when I started, I remember many children in my class were much older and more mature than I was. Unlike my prep school that had no more than 10 students in my class each year, Manchester High School had massive classes of almost 45 students each and six classes for each year group. This meant the school was gigantic and I remember being taken aback by how noisy it was in comparison to Bel Air Prep. 
I felt a little lost in my first year at high school. It was an adventure, but more abrasive than my previous school experiences. And quickly, I found the drama department and developed an immediate friendship with the drama teacher, Mrs. Juliet Kalai. She was warm, friendly, and had such a vivid imagination that young people loved her and could relate to her with ease. Mrs. Kalai ran the Manchester High School Drama Club, which took place every Friday afternoon after school. And when it finished, it was followed by her private members-only drama club, Ayida Young Theatre Players. I quickly joined both. I was raised in musical theatre and this felt like an immediate second home. Mrs. Kalai would put plays on with both drama groups and she also entered Manchester High School into the national festival competition where we would go through the various rounds and compete in order to eventually perform in the Ward Theatre in Kingston, reenacting the stories of national Jamaican heroes and their fight for freedom from the enslavement of the people of the triangular trade. Mrs. Kalai took a Yaide on trips to theatres in Kingston and was passionate about exposing her students to the performing arts, stage culture and the magical world of theatre. With all this new excitement, I eventually stopped dancing with the Culture School of Dance and focused on all the drama activities Mrs. Kalai provided. I never thought of her as a best friend, but rather as a drama auntie. And I spent all of my years at Manchester High School working with her both inside and outside of school. Mrs. Kalai had two children. Her daughter, Sabrina, who was friendly, creative and quirky, also attended Manchester High School and was in the year above me. While her son, Ramon Kalai, was much younger than us and to me he was just a goofy little kid that attended the local prep school. I had a fair rapport with Sabrina as she was a peer and attended all of Mrs. Kalai's drama groups and the holiday programmes. I didn't really know Ramon's personality because he was a young child and when I started training with Mrs. Kalai, he was in the junior group below me and didn't attend the same school as us. So it seemed as if he was always waiting around as her baby and just sitting on the sidelines. Over time, my relationship with Mrs. Kalai became closer and she would ask me to come to Saturday Drama Club an hour early so I could help her with the children in the junior class as my knowledge of the arts meant I could teach children younger than me. It was just like my relationship with my dance teacher and I loved it. I think that in hindsight, I was so passionate about the arts that I developed relationships with my teachers that was similar to me being a teacher's pet and assistant all at the same time. When I became an adolescent, I would get into trouble from time to time and my mother would ground me. I remember Mrs. Kalai begging for me on several occasions and persuading my mother to allow me to come in and act with her. My mother, an art enthusiast herself, has a soft spot for Mrs. Kalai and would usually allow it. Mrs. Kalai was not only creative, she was truly visionary. She delved into every nook and cranny to get exposure and experience for her students. Her pursuit took Ayada Young Theatre players outside of Jamaica and in my second year of high school, some of the members traveled to the Caribbean island of Anguilla to do a Save the Turtle performance campaign. The island hopped through Antigua and St. Martin to get to Anguilla and then back to Jamaica. I think that's the most time that I've spent with Ramon as he was still young at this stage and this trip mainly consisted of the younger members of the group. Additionally, Mrs. Kalai staged one to two semi-professional productions each year in the Mandeville local theatre called Cecil Charlton Hall, the same place where my dance teacher staged her own performances. If my memory serves me correctly, Ramon eventually joined Manchester High School when I was in my third year there and we very much viewed his year as teeny boppers babies who had just started high school. In the last year of my childhood in Jamaica, when I was 13 years old, one of my female friends from Ayayda Young Theatre Players was sexually assaulted by my brother, which I mention in episode four. I remember going home after a very late night rehearsal 
and going back to a yard a first thing in the morning. I never discussed this with anyone else outside of my friends at the time. Yet, it is important that I mention here that my mother, who had evidence of my brother's assault, refused to acknowledge it and displayed what I now view as toxic femininity, specifically Jamaican toxic femininity that is very prevalent throughout the society and that Mrs. Kalai herself would become an ambassador of. I trained with Mrs. Kalai until my family left Jamaica to head back to London. I find it hard to explain how much I loved Mrs. Kalai. She was a mentor, a teacher, an inspiration, a friend and a guide. She believed in my talents and my abilities. She spoke my creative language, which was very rare. She was passionate and she was bold. I loved her so much that when I returned to London, I vowed to maintain a connection with her and that's exactly what I did. The first time I returned to Jamaica a few years after, I didn't see Miss Kalai because she had taken her drama student to perform in London, continuing her legacy of opening theatrical doors of opportunity for Jamaica's youth. I have always visited Mrs. Kalai at Manchester High School and over a decade after, I had become a mother myself. I brought my daughter to meet Mrs. Kalai and to take part in her Ayayde drama summer program. At this time, I was a student at the University of Westminster in London, where I was studying commercial music. I took my daughter to Jamaica to see my childhood doctor, Dr. Quarry, after she experienced some health issues that the British doctors just could not resolve. He treated my daughter immediately, as efficient a practitioner as he was, and it was such a sentimental and positive experience that I started to want my daughter to go to my former prep school for a while and join the new Ayayde Theatre Group just to explore and to experience all the good things that I had while I was growing up in Mandeville. So my daughter started to attend Ayayde and it was like a dream come true for me. I spent the summers with her and Mrs. Kalai and the students and we spoke at length about plays, possibilities and opportunities. At this stage, I had studied performing arts for years in London and had enhanced my own theatre experience. So I started to plan to return to live in Mandeville after completing my studies, as Mrs. Kalai said she needed someone to take over a Yai day. And being a performing arts teacher of six years at this time, I thought it was a great idea. I always had this thing within me from the time that I migrated to London that there was something super special about Mandeville that I just couldn't find anywhere else and I always wanted to go home. When I went to visit Manchester High School, I don't remember seeing Ramon at this time, but I may have over the years in passing. Although I was paying for my daughter's training, I was a Mrs. Kalai enthusiast and was also volunteering as a teacher within Ayayde. Similar to when he was a prep school boy, I don't remember Ramon having an interest in performance and that is probably why he wasn't around. One evening, I went into Mandeville to visit a school friend as I had kept relationships with most people I went to school with. But I found that whenever I visited Mandeville, most of my friends no longer lived on the island apart from this one girl. She was also a mother now and worked in a bar across the street from Mandeville's Market. I was in my mid-twenties at this time. While talking to my friend, I saw Ramon Kalai and we greeted each other with love, respect and enthusiasm while catching up for the very first time since I had left in my teens. When he questioned me about what I was doing there, I told him I was visiting my friend. He told me he was going with some of his friends to a local stage show called Blase that used to take place beside the Winston Jones Highway every week. He invited me to come with him and I decided to think about it and get back to him. 
I had attended Blase several times before, both with my mother and neighbours from my neighbourhood. It had become a bit of a sensation in Manchester and was a weekly event in a traditionally quiet and quite boring parish. Blase was supposed to be Mandeville's equivalent to Kingston's more famous weekly stage shows and dances like Passa Passa and Weddy Weddy Wednesdays. I saw Ramon, who was in his early 20s, as harmless. Given our shared history and the fact that I had known him since he was a child, our families were so close, we knew each other's siblings, and I had known him at this stage for about 15 years. Plus, he was a junior to me, and I had been raised in a community with many young boys who were actually my very close friends, so I didn't immediately see him as a risk. So I decided to attend the event and I made my first mistake of that night. I told my friend where I was going and left the bar with Ramon and his male friend that I didn't really know. Looking back, I clearly thought of Ramon as a younger brother because I don't go anywhere with men I don't know, plain and simple. We walked towards a vehicle and the driver appeared. I was surprised to see the driver was a man called Shem, who I had seen around Mandeville since high school days, many years before. I remember him being outlandish and smarmy when I was a teenager. And as the old timers would say, my spirit never take him. And so I started questioning if I should still go. I told Ramon that Shem wasn't really my cup of tea, he wasn't my kind of person. And he just reassured me and said it was cool, I was going to the event with Ramon and not Shem. That was when I made my second mistake of the night and got into the car. We traveled down the cool mountainous roads towards Blase and by the time we arrived the event was in full swing. I think it was Rick Ross that was performing, but I'm not entirely sure because I had been to a few weekly stage shows there and I could have seen Rick Ross performing on another night. We partied for a few hours and took in the festivities and performances. I smoked a few splits, which was very standard for me. And Ramon had a bottle of vodka, so we didn't buy drinks, but had a few drinks in plastic cups. I had no more than two drinks because I have never been a big drinker and I don't like the feeling of being drunk. We left around 4 a.m. when it was still dark and the event was still going on. I remember getting into the back seat of the car with Ramon as his friend, I can't remember the name of, but he might be called Chris, sat in the front passenger seat and Shem sat in the driver's seat. As the car chugged back up the Winston Jones Highway and towards my home in Kingsland, I started to feel really sleepy and I remember thinking to myself that as the car was about four minutes away from my home, I could just close my eyelids just for a moment until I arrived home. I woke up the next day, several hours later, when the sun was shining brightly in the sky and I was in a strange bed in an even stranger house with Ramon Kalai on top of me, sexually assaulting me. I was so shocked as I hazily became more aware of what was happening and I started screaming and sluggishly pushing his body off of mine. I was in absolute shock and when I looked at the bottom of the bed, there was sitting Shem and the other guy. They were sitting there nonchalantly and had clearly been watching Ramon sexually violate me while I was unconscious. I couldn't understand how it could be daytime as I know that when I closed my eyes in the car, it was the dark of the early morning and yet, here I was in this strange room with the glaring sun coming through the bright window. What the fuck? I was so confused. I was so angry and nauseous and weak all at the same time. I shrieked at Ramon and asked the men what the fuck was going on. I had no memory of leaving their car, so where was I and how the fuck did I get there? 
I was half dressed at this stage and quickly found my clothes while cursing at the men. Strangely, Ramon and Shem started talking to me really coldly and quietly in a detached way. Like I wasn't the same person that had gone to this event with them. And they told me in menacing, hushed voices to keep my voice down so I wouldn't wake some man who was apparently sleeping next door. I did not give a damn and I kept screaming for them to take me home in the fear that they might decide to kill me instead as many Jamaican rapists choose to murder their victims. We left the house in an area I would later realize was Greenvale, a local community to my own community. As the car drove for a couple minutes and then turned onto the main road, going towards Hatfield, it was just a few meters away from the entrance to the same Winston Jones Highway. It became clear to me that the sleepy energy I felt in the car and my desire to just close my eyes matched with my inability to recollect what happened had to have been due to something being put in my drink, even though it was never out of my hands. To this day, I thankfully have no recollection of what happened from the dark of the morning to the bright light of the mid-morning sun. I don't need to say how confused and traumatized I was. They drove to my mother's front gate and I cursed them to hell as I walked into my front yard. That was the day Ramon and his friends earned themselves some bad karma and became my enemies. Any actions I have taken from this day should be seen as God's living grace, as I did consider getting someone to deal with the issue in a more Jamaican traditional way that would include typical blood spreading and a very violent manner. But I didn't. I went inside, had a shower, and immediately called the friend I had visited the night before. She was just as shocked as I was, and we spoke for most of the day while I tried to wrap my head around what had happened to me. I was not only angry with Ramon, who I blamed for intentionally drugging and assaulting me, I had mixed feelings about telling Mrs. Kalai, as she was his mother and my teacher and friend of over 15 years. But the very next day, I went to see her at Manchester High School. I went into her tiny office in what is known as the Top Hall, where most drama activities took place. It was in the same hall that my daughter was receiving drama training. I told Mrs. Kalai that Ramon had assaulted me. I immediately felt her cold response when she said she would speak to Ramon and get back to me. The very next day I visited again and she told me that Ramon had denied assaulting me and gave Mrs. Kalai the impression that what had happened was consensual. I was so shocked and bereft at her response as I hadn't expected he would admit it to her as what I had seen and known of Jamaican rapists so far, both in my own family and in society, was an ongoing denial and even dismissal of the issue. Mrs. Kalai dismissed me in exactly the same way. That was the day another part of me broke on the inside to see my teacher my daughter's teacher and a friend of over 15 years who I was trusting to take care of my own child behaving this way was repulsive, unbelievable and heartbreaking. I gained new insight into why Mrs. Kalai was so deeply immersed in the world of the arts. The truth was she could not accept reality to see that she immorally buried her head in the sand and denied my experience, a decision that has come back to haunt both her and Ramon this year in 2022, exactly 14 years later. In a future episode, I will speak about my healing journey in regards to this assault, as it took many years and much effort for me to regain some normality in my life due to the impact of these traumas. As I'm almost 3,000 words into this story, I have to jump to 2022. In part two of this series, I will go back to this point in the story and share what tools I used to heal and how they increased my insight into the fact that both Ramon Kalai 
and my brother's sexual assaults as mentioned in episode 4, my mother and Mrs. Kalai responses to their son's crimes is indeed not only a personal mental health issue, but also a very obvious symptom of being Jamaican. That is how unwell my culture is. If my mother or Mrs. Kalai were ever sexually assaulted when they were younger, they would have kept it to themselves and expected others to do exactly the same. In the next episode, I will also detail more information about the actions of Ramon and his friends following this incident, in addition to Mrs. Kalai. In this culture, it is commonplace for mothers to defend their rapist sons. And in Mrs. Kalai's instance, she made it possible for Ramon to go on to rape more women in the future. Deluded by the fact that she was my favorite teacher as a child and now as a young mother, she was my friend, allegedly, worthy of my ongoing focus and support. And this crushed me when she refused to accept what I told her about her son, Mrs. Kalai was just like my mother. I was already hesitant about reporting Ramon to the police as living in Mandeville as a child, I had seen the police being bought and sold by my father and many people from the Jamaican underworld. Unlike the UK system, which is still less than perfect, Jamaica's justice system is acutely corrupt and this is reflected by Jamaica's status as the number one murder capital in the world. A place where constant violent murder and assassination cases are rarely brought to justice or won in court much less sexual assault cases which have even poorer statistics. Just take a look at the ongoing 2022 Klansman Jamaica trial. You will see how corrupt the legal system is as many of the criminals have walked away completely free. I always feel like Mrs. Kalai's response affected me in quite a destructive way, emotionally, mentally and spiritually, because it mirrored my mother's response to my brother assaulting my friend from her own drama group 15 years later these Jamaican women were simply traitors of their own gender. I literally went into a numb state of autopilot living and not wanting to disrupt my daughter's life with this crazy unthinkable and even to myself often unbelievable situation. I made her complete her drama term and then left Jamaica for good. People always talk about toxic masculinity, but little is mentioned about toxic femininity. It does exist, and Mrs. Kalai is a perfect example of it. She is all fun and games until it is brought to her awareness that her own son is a predatory rapist, and then she goes into denial and immorality. I'm not mixing my words. As a mother of a daughter myself, the years have shown me just how diabolical and vile Mrs. Kalai's behavior has been. I love her as a human being, but my respect doesn't go past her education and theatrical pursuits because as a woman, she is immoral and a toxic entity and this is what she has chosen to be. I am sure that she herself is a victim of the culture, but it does take one person to stand up and do the right thing. And so this is what I'm doing today. So let's skip to 2022 when I decided to state online recently that I know for a fact Ramon Kalai is a rapist and I asked any other victims to come forward. I made some awareness posters and was very careful not to release any information. Within 24 hours, the first woman came forward and told me she had been sexually assaulted by Ramon Kalai and could I wait a while for her to get the courage to tell me. Cold sweat washed over my body. I had been so busy healing, I hadn't even questioned if he was doing it to other women. Like most women, at the time I felt like I was the unlucky one, but when I considered it, I decided to do a tarot reading to see if it was likely he had assaulted other women. And the reading, which is not evidence, gave a strong indication to the fact that he had. And this is the reason why I started my campaign. 
I had no evidence, just a hunch and a tarot reading. And yet, this young woman who I will now call Samantha to protect her identity eventually opened up to me to tell me the most harrowing story about how Ramon Kalai drug raped her one tragic night and her discovering the next day that he had not only assaulted her but he had raped her in her anus while she was unconscious. Samantha provided further details that can't be shared here, but I verified her story and I take this woman very seriously. Her rape happened only a few years ago and she asked me about going to court in a group case against Ramon, but at this stage I had refused to reveal my own assault details as I knew it could compromise the reports that were coming in. The very next day, this woman and another woman sent me a long list of women's names. They told me these women on the list had been assaulted by Ramon Kalai and included people he had relationships with to people he was simply friends with. To my horror, not only was this a reality, but reports came in that Ramon was known for committing statutory rape in his late 20s and early 30s, as he had a few public relationships with young women who were still in high school and yet to be 16, the legal age of consent. Specifically, young women from Bishop Gibson Girls High School in Mandeville were mentioned in the this instance. I wasn't sure about reaching out to these women as I personally know how traumatic sexual assault can be and I thought it was best to just follow them online and let them reach out if they wanted to but Samantha kept insisting that I contact them directly as she was quite distressed about the whole situation. She wants Ramon Kalai to go to prison but she lives in Mandeville and she's afraid to make a report without support. After contacting me, she started to panic and even considered leaving Jamaica because she fears her identity getting out and Ramon himself violently attacking her. What kind of man is Ramon? The second woman sent me the same exact list and stated angrily that she knew for a fact that Ramon is a rapist and the women on the list might feel afraid and ashamed to admit it. This makes sense as it goes in alignment with the stigma of sexual assault within Jamaican culture. I reached out to two women on the list, but they were so understandably defensive that I decided to stick to my original strategy of simply posting on my own page. It took me years to get to the space of speaking about my own sexual assault and I know that they deserve the same grace if they ever choose to come forward or not. A second survivor came forward to state that she was also sexually assaulted by Ramon. The details of her assault are so disgusting and specific, they cannot be shared here in order to protect her identity and her dignity but she also said she was drug raped by Ramon and assaulted without knowledge or consent. She wanted her story to be shared, but the significant details to be removed so he cannot identify who she is. I also had another woman reach out to me and she identified two women that she said were also assaulted by Ramon. The two women she named were on the original list of names provided to me and she provided a lot of information about how he groomed schoolgirls and adult women alike with promises of money and then sexually assaults them. I also discovered a couple years ago that the man Shem who was driving the car with Raman Kalai has sexually assaulted my school friend who also attended Bel Air Prep, Manchester High School and a Yaida Young Theatre Players. This assault happened when she was an adult like myself and was simply visiting Jamaica after leaving a decade before. This is the culture of Jamaica. So right now, I officially know of three women who have been assaulted via drug intoxication without consent, plus 
Many women have been identified to me and it is a fact that he has committed a series of statutory rapes, not as a teenager, but as a grown ass man of 27 years plus. This makes Ramon Kalai a serial rapist. In the next video, I will share more information that was brought to my attention about Ramon Kalai, some insight into his psychological profile and how his sister and school friends try to defend him since I exposed him as a rapist online, but his mother did not. In fact, prior to starting my campaign, I contacted both Ramon's mother and his sister Sabrina to inform them of what my intentions were with this documentary. I don't play dirty, so I thought I should warn them in advance. Sabrina had no knowledge of this incident as she was living in New York at the time and has been since. And her mother, shamefully but quite understandably, never told her about it. So she thought that in the spirit of her inherited toxic Jamaican femininity, she could deny what her brother had done. Little did Sabrina know that at the time that I was assaulted by Ramon, I had learned that she herself was assaulted in Mandeville and all these years later, I find out she had never told her mother. I will explore that further also in the next episode. This gave me the impetus to continue as every rapist defender I've ever met has been a Jamaican woman. And I felt it the right time to highlight not only Ramon and his transgressions, but this disease and sickness within Jamaican culture at home and also abroad. It spreads through the generations and sends shockwaves of terror through Jamaican women and girls who have experienced it all across the globe. I know that because of the work that I have been doing. Mrs. Kalai called me a few weeks ago and she apologized to me. She attempted to explain why she made the decision to defend Ramon Kalai and she admitted to me that she never believed him and regretted her decision. She said she always wanted to ask me how I was. She wanted to check if I was okay, but she just didn't have the words after all of these years. However, she did not regret it enough not to imply, like a typical rapist empathizer, that enough time just might have passed to make it okay for Ramon to get away with this assault. She did not know that by this stage, I had received two separate reports and much information from people about her son. I informed Mrs. Kalai that the day she experiences a sexual assault, she has the full right to respond to it in the way she deems appropriate, but she should not try to steer those that she basically betrayed, hence me. I reminded her she should be thankful her son has been alive and well for all of these years. And I reminded her there is no time limit on reporting sexual assault in Jamaica. As ridiculous and corrupt as the Jamaican legal justice system clearly and most unfortunately is. I have a recording of my conversation with Mrs. Kalai to keep as evidence that she was informed of Ramon's behaviour and she herself says she didn't believe him, but she chose to bury her head in the sand. This audio proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that my statements are true and indeed not as baseless as Ramon with his narcissistic, psychopathic, psychological thinking would love folks to assume, but facts. In closing, my favorite teacher's son, Ramon Kalai, sexually assaulted me 14 years ago and given the information provided by his victims, the span of his assaults are over 12 years long as he has kept up this activity up until just two years ago. And remember, those are only the women that I know of, the ones that have officially come forward. It is my hope that this video, the first detailed revelation about Ramon Kalai, will inspire are more women to courageously come forward. In my research, I learned how the date rape drug is readily available in Jamaica and can be easily found for purchase in wealthy communities like Negril, Montego Bay, Kingston, Ocherias, and Mandeville. At this stage, 
I am super happy and thankful because Ramon is not getting away with his evil ways and I lean on the strength of my creator, the power of my great ancestors and the truth of my own destiny and inner being who has clearly refused to accept this dual betrayal. You see, the way I process things is I don't speak on issues until I have completed my healing and I don't speak on most issues. I am happy to facilitate the healing of survivors as I have been working with victims of sexual trauma for over nine years. In making this introductory video, I am standing up for myself. I am standing up for the other survivors of Ramon's abuse, for all Jamaican women and men who have survived sexual assault and all survivors of sexual abuse on this planet living and dead. I am not ashamed of my experience. My shame is in my culture. My shame is knowing Mrs. Kalai and her demon son. The shame falls on Ramon Kalai, his rape associates, his parents who provided the perfect environment for the cultivation of a psychopath, a narcissist, a man whose psychological profile means I don't expect him to ever admit his wrongs, but who has already started to pay the painful price for his crimes against Jamaican women. This is not a court testimonial and many key details have been omitted from the stories for the respect of womanhood for privacy and the protection of the identity of these survivors. They are thankful I have the courage to expose Ramon Kalai for the beast he truly is. Additionally, this video is for my audience and survivors of sexual assault, not Ramon, his defenders, nor his spineless empathizers. In future episodes, I will explore the responses to my campaign and how ignorant people are without appropriate education of the rape culture that they themselves perpetuate daily. May we all truly heal and grow. In Jamaica, we have a saying, God na sleep. And this idea of a supernatural being waking up and intervening is very apt for this situation. But the truth is, it takes one person to speak the truth and to create a domino effect of truth speakers among truth seekers for meaningful change to occur. May this be part of that change needed within Jamaica and within our culture globally. We are all very much at risk. Send in much appreciation again to every single woman who came forward. I love and respect you all and I wish you all victory. If you have been assaulted by Ramon Kalai, please contact me via the links below or email ramonkalaiabuse at gmail.com. All details will be kept confidential and your story will only be shared if you want it to be. Thank you very much for tuning into this video. I wish I could have put everything here, but this is the longest episode so far. And in part two, I will explore this topic further and share more information about my conversations with Mrs. Kalai and the actions of these criminals. Many thanks, Belly Fam. Please share, subscribe if you haven't already, like the video and comment below. Please note, this channel is not a safe space for sexual offenders, their defenders, nor their empathizers. May the healing continue. And as the old timers would say, walk good.